It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. We're so close to summer. In fact, many people don't go by when summer actually starts, right around my birthday, June 20th. They consider Memorial Day to be the start of summer, Labor Day to be the end of summer. I've got a couple of related topics to discuss travel and cooling your house this summer so airfares have gone through the roof and it's funny I, I do a morning segment in Los Angeles with uh, Bill Handel on KFI and first thing he asked me the other day was so you never talk about any airfare deals anymore do you Clark and that's the truth why am i not talking about them because airfare deals are not deals right now the fares have gone up by enormous amounts and they've gone up because of all the pent-up demand of the last two years with people who have not traveled through covid and i keep talking to people on planes who say, hey, this is the first time I've flown since the end of 19 or early in 20. And they're kind of freaked out being back with people everywhere around them. But there's all that, plus people who had the vouchers where flights were canceled or whatever, and or they canceled their flights and the airlines gave them the vouchers that gave them a period of time to use them, and people are rushing to use all those so we've got this massive spike in demand pretty much all at once. And then you add on top of it, the airlines got a huge number of pilots to quit uh, early in 20 and in the summer of 20 to take early retirement, gave them these really sweet buyouts to go away. And now the airlines are sitting way short of pilots, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pilots short. We were already facing pilot shortages in the United States, but now really severe. Airlines are uh, pretty much across the board having to cut back their flight schedules during the peak of the peak season because they don't have enough crews to fly these flights. So it is the perfect storm for your wallet. What do you do? Well, I have a number of strategies that I talk about regularly that now are essential. Number one, when you fly. With summertime, fares are the highest in June and July. And then when August comes around, fares steadily tick downward. And there's a specific reason why, in fact, Summertime travel really starts happening in late May these years because it follows school calendars. In a lot of states in the country, kids go back to school the first week of August and they get out in mid-May or the third week of May or something like that. So the uh, calendar has really shifted. It means that... uh, Families that live in parts of the country where the school calendar is more traditional, starting around Labor Day and ending in June, there's great airfare opportunities in August to find deals on flights. Now, deals not like prior year deals, but I mean deals compared to what people are paying in July and August, I mean in June and July. And if you don't have kids, Man, wait till September to take the big trips you want to take. Accommodations will be cheaper. Uh, Places that you like to visit will be less crowded. And the airfares are so, so much better in the fall than they are in summer in any year. But this year, the difference is going to be even more dramatic. So when is one part of it? Where is the second part? We now have all these deep discounters. 
the big three are Allegiant, Spirit, and Frontier. And then we've got the smaller, newer ones. And I think of Breeze and Avalo is the two that are particularly of note, but there are others as well. Now, you don't necessarily have to fly one of these five, but if you look at their route maps and you think about where you want to go from, is there any airport near you that one of these five flies out of? And at the other end where you want to go, is there any of these five flying to near or where you want to go? That when you're flexible about where you depart from or where you land, or it can be both, or it can be one or the other, you can make a big difference in the price because all the airlines respond to what these five deep discounters do with their routes and their fares. An example is in the Northeast U.S., there's an airport that is near where Krista grew up that has more and more discount air service that's Stewart, Stewart Air Force Base. Yes. And it's the Stewart International Airport now. Stewart International Airport. That there are a lot of discount flights out of Stewart. There are discount flights out of New Haven. There are discount flights out of Hartford. And so people all around the Northeast are learning about these areas where you can go fly at discounts. You're going to Florida from wherever in the country. Florida is chock a block full of airports. And the fare difference from going into, let's say, St. Pete instead of Tampa, or Orlando Sanford instead of Orlando International, or Daytona instead of Orlando. I can just name one after another after another, where in Florida, you look on the southeast Florida, you've got right in order, you've got West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, 67 miles distance from West Palm Beach to Miami. In that 67 mile difference, you could have huge airfare differences just by looking at the geography. And so this works in much of the country except a lot of the mountain state regions because the distances are so very large. But an example I gave last time we talked about this was when I was going to Bozeman, Montana. No, I was going to Missoula. And the fare into Missoula was a zillion bucks. I mean, a zillion. And I wasn't trying to fly on a private jet. I was flying on a regular commercial airline and coach. But I flew into Billings, and it was a third the cost. And that's where I rented my car instead of in Missoula and just drove across. And it wasn't a bad drive on I-94, whatever the number was. Anyway, um, and it was quick, the drive across. I saw things I hadn't seen before. And my wallet kept money in it that I was happy to have because it was enough to pay for the whole rest of the trip, <laughs> just what I saved on the airfare. So I'm only talking about airfare right now and air travel because we talked about the hotel stuff recently on the podcast. What if you want to go international? A lot of Asia off limits right now because of restrictions due to COVID. But then other parts of Asia have opened back up. And Thailand, as an example, uh, depends so much on tourism, they've really opened back up there. We went on staff trip there how many years ago? Is that I, eight years ago? Sounds right to me. I think it's time You're better again? with dates. Oh, that was a wonderful trip. I think it's time to go back to Thailand. Anyway, um, Europe, the airfares to Europe from most of the United States have been crazy high, except for out of New York, the fares out of the New York metro area to Europe have been really good lately. A lot of airfares in the threes round trip, 320, 380, that kind of stuff. And so from so much of America, even with our now higher domestic airfares, it can work for you to buy one ticket to New York, second ticket across the Atlantic to Europe, and take advantage of the much cheaper fares. Use google.com slash flights 
or Hopper or any of these fair search tools where you're able to see this. Also, you can go to kayak.com slash explore, and you can look at airfares from your hometown to pretty much any part of the globe or anywhere in the United States, and then you can compare what are the fares like if you look at the next closest airport, or you look, hey, if I want to go to Rome, how much cheaper is it to go to Italy from New York than it is to go from my hometown? And then what's the cost to go from my hometown to New York? And the, I love putting on Google, I'll just put Europe as my and yeah, flexible dates. And it's great. You can see everywhere you could go if there's a certain region you want to be in. Or you Are know, you stealing my map. thoughts? You're stealing I'm my sorry. thoughts, Krista. Because uh, the reason Krista is stealing my thoughts is I was going to talk about uh, the, the fact that with Europe, like Italy, um, my daughter, my middle child, who just finished college, is going to Europe and she's flying into Brussels because the, even though she was really trying to get to Milan, the airfare to Brussels was less than half the cost of the airfare from Los Angeles where she lives to Milan. So she's flying to Brussels, has to sit there four hours, and then she's taking this ultra cheap flight from Brussels to Milan, and we saved a fortune. That's awesome. All right, well, I actually have a question about about this. This is from Catherine in Florida. Did you know that a new low-cost low transatlantic airline, Norse Air, is going to start flying on June 14th from Oslo to four U.S. destinations? I saw it in our local broadcast. They will be flying to L.A., New York, Miami, and Orlando. And get this, Cheapskate Clark, I hear they're offering an introductory fares of $149. One they, way. They fly Boeing 787s, which are longer, more comfortable, and more fuel efficient. I don't work for them. I'm just excited over the cheap fare. And I also want to piggyback on Catherine's question and say I keep seeing these great fares from French B. Yeah. So I don't know if you want yeah, to talk about these airlines. Yeah, there's a number. There's a new one out of Iceland that's taken the place of Wow Air that failed. And we're going to have a number of these itty-bitty European discounters that work much like if you've ever flown Spirit Frontier Allegiant, where you buy your ticket and then everything else you pay extra for. It tends not to be the greatest amount of legroom on the flights, but this is an opportunity for you to save a lot of money. And the full fare airlines really don't pay attention to these uh, small European deep discounters that fly across the Atlantic because they know their bread and butter, the business travelers, are never going to fly any of these airlines and I remember for TV I was doing a story where I was flying over this was uh, pre-pandemic I was flying over on one deep discounter and flying back on another and then we had to cancel the trip and then both of those discounters failed <laughs> so never got to redo that one so you think Catherine should give it a shot oh yeah you just always pay by credit card and uh, yeah, why not? And a 787 is a very comfortable transatlantic aircraft. This is from Scott, Wisconsin. When I book hotels in Hawaii, is it necessary to include hotels where breakfast is included? I know it's more expensive when it's included, but what less expensive options are available? So, I knew you'd want to address this because yeah, this Scott, is one of your big travel uh, uh, Yeah, I have never, ever, not <laughs> ever paid for optional breakfast included in a hotel rate on any of my visits to Hawaii where I've been probably about a dozen times to the Hawaiian Islands ain't never going to happen because there's plenty of well first of all on every Hawaiian Island stop at Costco right by the airport terminal because on every Hawaiian Island Costco built one right next to the airport for the Californians who who treat Hawaii as a second home, and they go right from the airport in their rental car to Costco, stock up, and they take stuff to their hotel. And the prices at Costco in the Hawaiian Islands very similar to what it is in the United States. So we go and we get uh, breakfast kind of items. Usually, even in hotels in Hawaii, there will usually be a refrigerator that you can refrigerate a small amount of stuff. Uh, you can have your, if you want bottled water, you can get it there things you're going to snack on during the week, that kind of stuff, 
you want to stop at the wall at the costco before you go to whatever hotel resort or condo you're staying at i just want to also say having just been in hawaii if you're a coffee fan i know you're not but i am they have you have to stop at one of these little roadside people will set up little food truck kind of looking things where they sell the fresh coffee from hawaii and it's incredible and cheap so I really enjoyed that when I was there. This is from Sharon in North Carolina. Clark, I'll be traveling internationally again after a five-year break and recently heard of Clear, an airport entry option. Given changes for security and COVID reasons, is Clear better, safer, and or quicker than TSA PreCheck and global entry systems? So Clear is different and much more expensive than PreCheck and global entry. Clear is really only worth it if you travel really frequently. Like I'm in the airports... Um, lately like five times a month and so i'm a clear member and and it's worth it to me i get a discount because of my status in one of the airline frequent flyer programs in fact this year it's free for me so it's really an easy decision but otherwise you pay a fortune to be a clear member i think it's 189 now a year where pre-check works out to be 17 a year global entry 20 dollars a year paid for five dollars at a time i mean five years at a time so clear is really for the person who values their time to the max and is flying all the time otherwise pre-check and global entry absolutely great that's plenty and if you have a family that travels a lot you can share like you have a clear membership you can get family members for 50 cheaper. 50 bucks yeah. so. for each additional family member under the age of 18 or 21, something like that. And the website is clearme.com. They take a scan of your eyeballs and your fingerprints, but now it seems they only, when you get to the clear machines, they only use your eyeballs now. They don't pull them out. (laughs) You just look into this reader, and then you go straight to the belt at the airport, you know, at, at security. You bypass pretty much everything. And at most airports, other than the very busiest of them, you bypass lines of all types. There are a small number of airports where even clear has long lines, but they're nothing compared to pre-check or regular security. So coming up, we got to talk about higher energy costs for your home affecting your wallet. What should you be doing about it right now to protect your wallet this summer. Okay, so I just want to know, does the U.S. Department of Energy have any actual humans working there, or are they robots? Krista, I want you to guess what temperature the U.S. Department of Energy recommended recently we should have the thermostat set in our home when we're sleeping in summer. Sleeping in summer? Um, 70? 85 degrees. What? 85. Okay, so who is ever going to be able to sleep in 85 degrees? Not I mean, I'm girl. old enough that I remember in summer when there was no air conditioning and trying to sleep at night. 85, it's almost like... I mean, you, literally, why even have your air conditioning? Right. So, I mean, it is true. Whoever the brainiac is who came up with this at Department of Energy, who said, yeah, when you're sleeping, keep your thermostat at 85 degrees in summer. Really? Okay. No. Like, you wouldn't even do that. Oh, no. So, no way. So and what we do... do crazy stuff with right, They want it 82 degrees when you're not sleeping. Oh, no. Now, we keep, <laughs> we keep our home at 78 when we're not sleeping. Mm-hmm. And when we're out of town, we keep it at 82 but what temperature do you think we have it set on to sleep? Well, you told me in the winter you keep it, you only let it get up to 65. In the summer, what do you do? Summer, 68 degrees. Oh, nice. That's I'm what I do. I'm burning the energy at night yeah, because any, you talk to any sleep specialist, you read about any sleep studies, anything like that, people sleep best with temperatures in the 60s. We sleep with an ultra-thin blanket in the summer and the winter because we keep the thermostat really really low um we have 
really thick blanket and a big uh, comforter thingy. And so basically it's like we're at the North Pole Mm -hmm. and we sleep with all this stuff on us. And so this is this is really lunacy for the feds to say that you need to keep the thermostat up so high. Uh, But I'm such a believer in the artificial intelligence thermostats, which the first of the breed was Nest. Now there are, I don't know, hundreds of them. And so it's really just what style you like, what's ease of use that you like, learns your patterns, and really takes care of getting the maximum efficiency of out of your heating and cooling in terms of what it costs you to do it, and at the same time gives you the level of comfort you want to have with energy savings, all tied up as a nice bundle. So these AI thermostats will usually lower the cost of your heating and cooling bills by about 25%. I know the thermostat people will say that they lower that part by 33%, 40%. I don't know where they're coming up with those numbers. Everything I've seen from an independent says about 25% of your heating and cooling costs. So it really does make a difference. But what we're talking about with the temperatures is the spread in winter and summer between what the outdoor temperature is and what you keep it inside as you get that gap larger and larger that's what makes your bills go crazy and that's why especially when you're not in the house you don't want to be cooling an empty house you don't turn the thermostat off in winter or summer big mistake because then the system has to work way too hard in summer to cool the house back down and winter to heat it back up. Well, plus, if you live in an area with high humidity, my HVAC person told me you oh, want to keep mold. it. mold. Yeah, you can get mold in the mold attic. Mold in the summer, yeah. busted pipes in the winter. Right. Yeah. So you want to you wanna keep the house functioning, but and you don't want, if you're, if you're working, if you're someone who's actually working a regular schedule now, instead of one of these hybrid-y things, and you know you're gone every day from da-da to da-da, then with these automatic thermostats, you can set the temperature um, significantly higher during those many hours you're gone, and then it will start working to cool it off typically an hour before your typical return home. It'll learn that over time with any of the smart thermostats. If they're not as high IQ as they should be, then you can set it manually. You can set it day by day, and you can leave settings in place till your lifestyle changes to get you those lower bills and the comfort you want. So actually, eighty-five degrees. That's crazy. Eighty-five degrees while sleeping. My husband, though, he does. He has to bundle up at night. Like he's got a long sleeve, like two shirts on, and and long flannel pants even in the summer because I like it so cold to sleep. Sixty-eight. You know, if you did actually what the what is typically recommended, I think it's 63 degrees, is, gets you the maximum I could do sleep. that. Okay, well, here's one from Alan in Kansas, a little twist on this. I live in an apartment on the ground level. I work 12 hours a day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. For optimal cost savings, how should I set my thermostat? Turn it off and turn it back on when I get home or set it to a higher setting like 78 to 80 degrees? I don't see the need in cooking a place all day. I'm not at to enjoy, but I don't want to overwork my AC unit either. I don't believe Nest is an option as my landlord isn't very keen on allowing tenants to install stuff like that. But in Kansas, we've already had 95 plus degree days. So, uh, Alan, ditto a lot of what I said before your question. And let me add this. So, these thermostats are pretty simple to install you can buy one you save the landlord's thermostat install yours and when you move out of the apartment you reinstall theirs so that it will do this work for you automatically and yes you do want to boost that temperature during the day a fair amount to 82 okay that's what doe says so we'll go with 82, just not their sleep thing. And uh, when you're returning home, you can then have it set automatically 
You let it automatically come up with a cycle, or you can set it up where each workday, it automatically, 6 o'clock when you're leaving work and you're going to be back home sometime in the 6 o'clock hour, it'll already be in the process of cooling it down for you. And this is from Andrea in Alabama. Scrolling through my podcast one day, I came across yours, and for some reason I subscribed to it and was an instant fan. Finance was never something discussed in my family growing up, so as an adult, I never gave it much thought. I was so surprised how much I enjoyed listening because I was sure I'd be bored to death. Boy, was I wrong. I listen to you every morning as I get dressed for work. I just felt like reading that part. I recently opened a (laughs) retirement 403B plan with my work and starting at 6% and with my place of business adding 3%. My question is, is there anything I should know about this plan or anything you would recommend I do going forward? Andrea, thank you, thank you, thank you for asking me this question. I want you to go to the website 403BWISE, 403BWISE, and they will give you such a thorough education on how to know whether the 403B plan your employer offers is good or bad. What makes a 403B plan good or bad? A lot of 403B plans come with extremely high fees and commissions. And so what you need to find out from your own plan, and it'll be in the plan documents, you might have to ask for the plan documents, is disclosure of what kind of fees you're paying. Many times with a 403B plan, you will have multiple layers of fees that can add up to as much as 3% of the money you're putting in, where with a good employer-provided 401K, you'll be paying fees 1 30th of what you pay in a 403B plan. So if yours has the really high fees, you want to put in just to where you pick up that 50% match from your employer. Your six adding their three. And after that, you want to go into your own Roth IRA, which you can go into at one of these ultra low fee providers that I have on my investment guide and pay again, typical cost one thirtieth of what you're paying on that 403B. And I'm so glad that you are enjoying what we talk about and that you're not finding me just to be like a replacement for a sleeping pill puts you to sleep at night and the more you know about that 403b the better it's going to protect your future growth of money for your financial security and retirement someday our social team sent me this question from someone on Instagram and it responds to when you talked about accessory dwelling units and putting those on your property. It's from NDNNG on Instagram. During this hot real estate market, is it better to convert a garage to an ADU than purchase an investment property? Okay, so not just during a hot real estate market, in every market, uh, creating an ADU on your own property is much, much, much more profitable than having a standalone traditional rental property. Because with a traditional rental property, you've got to buy the land and entire structure. With an ADU, accessory dwelling unit, you're taking a room over a garage, you're taking a basement room or whatever, and you're turning it into a rental unit. And as long as it's a separate entrance, private from the rest of your home, you maintain your privacy and the profitability of a rental property in your own home or over your garage or if it's a freestanding garage and above the garage, the profitability of that is mind-blowing, mind-boggling. So yes, in any real estate market, having an ADU as a rental at your own home is fantastic. By the way, a basement apartment is not considered to be an accessory dwelling unit. Technically, it's supposed to be like like a whole separate structure, but the idea is converting space in your home or on your property into a rental is extremely successful for people as a way to supplement income or make income. And I want to thank you so much for listening today. Remember, our Team Clark Consumer Action Center is on the job for right at almost 30 years, providing one-on-one free advice and information to you. If you're having a problem, a question, 
you just need help, we are here to serve you with one-on-one -on -one free advice from 10 in the morning Eastern to 4 in the afternoon Eastern. You can see everything you need to know about getting free one-on-one -on -one advice at clark.com slash CAC.